Hello, Dr. Rachie here. Welcome to The Skeptic Zone, episode 18, for February the 20th, 2009. This week we present a super special Ben Goldacre show. Part one is an exclusive interview about the Jenny Barnett LBC affair, and part two is a continuation of my interview with Ben from two weeks ago. But first, if you tuned into last week's show, you would have heard me talk about the circumstances surrounding Ben Goldacre once again being threatened with legal action. This followed him posting an excerpt from a January 7th broadcast of Jenny Barnett's talkback show on LBC Radio. This broadcast has probably become best known for Jenny's attack on a caller named Yasmin, an NHS nurse who called in to correct some of Jenny's misinformation about vaccination. On this week's Skeptic Zone special, we speak to Ben Goldacre to get his side of the story, and also his impressions of the phenomenal response from sceptical bloggers and supporters across the world. Hello, Ben Goldacre, and welcome again to the Skeptic Zone. Hi, hello, how are you doing? How are you is more to the point. It's been a crazy week for you this week, I imagine. Uh, oh, no, that's all just sort of childishness and distractions, isn't it? Um, but you're right, LBC uh, did send me a sort of rather threatening legal thing, uh, which I don't think it's n- surprising that many people have interpreted their actions over the past week as uh, an attempt to stifle debate on a very irresponsible piece of broadcasting by mm. LBC um, a couple of weeks ago. Can we get on to the contents of that broadcast in a moment, Ben, but can I start off by asking you a little bit about the phenomenal reaction that's uh, occurred around the world from your supporters and bloggers? It's really been a Streisand effect, as they describe it this week, hasn't it? It is, yeah. Um, I mean, do people know what uh, what happened, or should I explain? Can you start off by telling us how it all started? Because you received this 44-minute excerpt from... Jenny Barnett's LBC broadcast from a reader, didn't you? Is that how you became aware of it? That's right, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I only really sort of write about stuff that people send in to me. Um, and actually, I got contacted by a nurse called, called Yasmin, who had rung in to this radio show run by somebody called Jenny Barnett, who's a very uh, well-known uh, and wealthy TV and radio presenter in the UK. And she'd rung in because she'd heard Jenny Barnett saying some really very foolish and irresponsible things about the MMR vaccine, which, uh, as you know, in the UK is a long-standing, effectively hoax perpetrated by the media for the past 10 years. And and it's it's the most powerful example, I think, of irresponsible science broadcasting um, in the UK because the media's MMR hoax has resulted in, in quite sort of serious public health consequences. There was the mumps outbreak yeah. in 2005, which is arguably down to um, the, the drop in MMR use and then there's also um, the exponential rise in measles cases which have gone up by at least 2,000 percent over the past seven years that the hoax uh, has been running. Mm. So there was this very irresponsible piece of broadcasting and Yasmin as a nurse who'd rung in and tried to sort of counter some of the foolishness um, being spouted by Jenny Barnett and others and was sort of very concerned and said you might be interested in this clip. So I uh, mm. went went to the site, grabbed a copy, excerpted just the bit that was um, that was about MMR, which was about forty four minutes long. Um, and when I say I accepted it, I mean what I actually did was I posted on Twitter saying, um, mm-hmm. "Has anybody got the necessary skills to cut down an MP three for me, please?" Uh, <laughs> and somebody I have no idea who I've, I can't even remember his name. It's terrible, isn't it? I ought to I ought to thank him properly. Um, but somebody just sort of you know pinged me back with an email and said. Uh, here it is. Um, and I posted it up on mm. my blog, assuming that this was you know, a fairly normal and reasonable thing to do. And I posted it up saying, you know, this is a ridiculous clip and here are some of the ridiculous things in it. Um, and it's my belief that this exemplifies some of the worst. You know, this is, this is a good illustration of the wider problem of, of, of the misrepresentation of evidence on MMR in the media. And, and in fact, what I was hoping for was 
because it was so bad. I mean, you have to listen to it. It really is very, very bad. Oh, um, believe me. But, believe me, Ben, I've listened to it. <laughs> it's a joy in some respects. I mean, you have to take pleasure from these things, you know. But, um, but It wasn't uh, easy. It wasn't easy. It's not easy listening, no. It's not Burt Bacharach. Um, but but the, the the thing that I was hoping for was that it would be um, it would be a useful resource because it, it felt to me as if it, this clip genuinely did exemplify almost every single one of the canards, almost every single one of the misunderstandings and misrepresentations that quacks and irresponsible journalists have made about MMR vaccines over the past 10 years. And it felt to me like it, it was almost yeah. the, the sort of, you know, the, the Ur document. It was the, it was the paradigmatic example, the perfect illustration. It was, you know, there was, you know, it, it, it was everything you need to know about how the media have misrepresented the evidence on MMR with such catastrophic and tragic mm. consequences. And there was, you know, there were maybe sort of, I don't know, 50 or 100 re responses on the blog. And, um, you know, you can't, you can't make people on the internet do what you want and you wouldn't want to. It's, you know, it's like herding cats or making water flow downhill. You know, you sort of throw ideas out there. And I have to admit, like a little bit of me, a tiny little bit of me, because I don't, you know, it's not that I think people should do what I would like them to do, but a tiny little bit of me sort of felt... Ah, oh, you know, some of the comments here are really good, but I was really hoping that people would really go for it and that we could we could sort of, you know, take analyze this line by line and have this perfect thing. But it, I guess it looks like that's going to happen, and that's not mm. a problem, you know. And maybe I'll find the time myself to go through all forty-four minutes. And the and the post was pretty much dead, mm. you know. So I got this thing from their head of legal, and it was all like, you have to take this down. It's a copyright infringement. Words I don't even know the meaning of. Um, and obviously, mm. I did what what literally anybody would do which is um, I took it down because I don't have the personal resources to fight a, um, to fight a, a case over a grey area in copyright. I mean, that's, you know, it's ridiculous. The LBC and Global Radio are a company valued at hundreds of millions of pounds. Global Radio bought LBC a couple of years ago for £170 million, so Global Radio themselves must be worth an enormous amount of money. And it's all very well for them to say, well, you know, it's a legal grey area, we could argue the toss. But in reality, it's very obvious that there's no way I can, I can argue the toss about this. I mean, yeah, then lots of people really quite touchingly actually sort of went, you know, this is a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> and um can i tell you what happened on on this side ben yeah yeah i in fact had a copy of um of it from the, your podcast but oh. i hadn't heard it yet and richard saunders had heard it right. and he said to me that he w he wanted to play it to me but he said to me i know that after five minutes you're going to start screaming at me <laughs> and telling me to stop <laughs> to turn it off <laughs> and that indeed is exactly what happened in fact it is quite you do have to be sort of physically restrained to listen to it don't you it's very difficult, and I, I, we talked about this on our podcast last night, and I mentioned to people if they are a bit sensitive to stupidity, they should perhaps consider reading the transcript, which is a bit less painful. I disagree, actually. I mean, I think, I think the hilariousness of how, of, how they back, of, of, of how their actions have backfired is when it's written down in black and white. I mean, I, I agree that, you know, her, her presentation and voice is obviously confrontational and, 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 and hostile and infuriating, and that's why she's employed by the talk radio station, because she's you know confrontational yes. and infuriating that's you know that's her that's her appeal but actually i think when it's written down in black and white it looks quite a lot worse <laughs> <laughs> we decided to post it on youtube i don't know if you if you know it's up there but richard put it up on youtube because that was when the you had said help i don't want to have it up anymore yeah yeah so we stuck it up there and then then after that that was when everyone started blogging about it and then it eventually appeared on wikileaks it, it did, yeah, and also people started doing sort of transcripts of it and then hosting sort of different sections of the transcript in different places, and so, you know, it was a sort of, mm. it was a very predictable outcome. I mean, the thing that surprised me, I suppose, was the story gets worse, as, as you know, and as we'll come to, but you've kind of got to wonder whether... I get the sense that Jenny Barnett and LBC didn't really have very good PR advice on this uh, and didn't really have very good new media advice. And actually, I think also not really very good legal advice because I, th I think in an ideal world the advice that you get from a lawyer on issues of um, copyright and reputation and defamation and so on uh, should also include um, a consideration of the risks um, of being perceived as being heavy-handed but perhaps I mean I don't know what the sort of ch chain of reasoning was for LBC I suppose I don't really mind except 
I mean, the phenomenal insightlessness that they have demonstrated since is is genuinely staggering, actually. So your blog crashed a couple of times because it was linked to places <laughs> like... Um, yeah, got, Boing Boing, I think. It got linked on Boing Boing, which I think... Is that is Boing Boing still the biggest blog on the internet? Because um, it, it is fairly mm. stupid, really, that, you know, 44 minutes of a clip of something that was broadcast into our kitchens and cars on public airwaves, you know. Um, I mean, it, it's pretty natural to assume that if you've... If there's some audio from that that's made up substantially of people from the, um, who are members of the public ringing in and and... You know, it's a matter of really important public discussion and stuff. I mean, I don't know what the law says, but if the law says that's wrong, and I don't have the money to find out if it does or not, yeah. but if the law says that's wrong, then the law is, is wrong, as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, then weirdly, Stephen Fry, um, I assume yes. Stephen Fry is equally yeah. famous in Australia and America. Yeah, Stephen Fry uh, oh, yes. tweeted it, and he's got about a bazillion Twitter followers. Uh, and <laughs> fact, Stephen, Stephen Fry posted a comment on my blog, which is like a sort of internet knighthood. I really felt like I'd won the internet at that mm. moment. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and that brought in lots of visitors. And yeah, the, well, I mean, to say the website crashed is a bit unfair. Well, no, I mean, the website did crash. Sure. So can you tell us something about the early day motion that's now going on in, in Parliament <laughs> with Nor- Norman Lamb and Evan Harris? What's that all about? Yeah, well, so then Can it you briefly became... explain to us what that is, Ben? Because Australians don't know what that means. Can you just give us a brief overview of what an early day motion is? OK, so an early day motion isn't like, you know, it's not like an act of parliament. It's not this sort of amazing, big, exciting thing. Um, but an early day motion is basically if there's an MP who, um, who thinks that, you know, who has something important that they think um, needs attention and perhaps needs a show of support from other MPs... Um, and that may be a sort of seed for subsequent political action, um, then they can put an early day motion down and it goes in a book in in the lobby or somewhere in Parliament um, and then MPs can sign it to demonstrate their support and and, um, members of the public can contact their MP and ask them to um, sign it. Uh, Evan Harris, but actually the the proposer, I think, was was officially Norman Lamb, who's the Lib Dem Shadow Shadow Health Secretary or whatever, uh, posted that up and... um, yeah, it's been signed by 28 MPs so far, which isn't bad for an early day motion, I have to say. And it's um, and it's been signed by proper people, you know, um, Glenda Jackson, Mark Oaten. What is in this early day motion, Ben? Right. What is it actually saying? MMR vaccine and the media, EDM 754, uh, that this House expresses its support for the combined MMR vaccine, notes with concern the re-emergence of measles and the loss of life and long-term health problems which will afflict children as a result of the decline in the vaccination rate which followed Dr Andrew Wakefield's now discredited research paper suggesting a link between MMR vaccine and autism expresses its disappointment that ill-informed comments by presenters such as Jenny Barnett on her LBC radio show will continue to cause unfounded anxieties for many parents and are likely to result in some parents choosing not to vaccinate their children, recognises the right of Jenny Barnett as a parent to make her own judgment about vaccinations for her own children, but implores her and others in the media to act more responsibly when making comments in the public domain and further expresses its hope that in the future, reporting on the issue of MMR will be less sensationalist and more evidence-based. So... That's fantastic. It is pretty good, isn't it? And if you're a a sort of... I mean, it's a bit of a a slapdown for Jenny Barnett and LBC, isn't it? I mean, you'd have have thought... If it was me, at that point, I'd have gone, all right, look, you know, we're sorry it was foolish... Let me just say publicly, I'm, you know, we're, we're, we're really going to try not to do this again. Um, we're not going to let Jenny Barnett talk about medical issues until she's bothered to familiarise herself with the basics of the discipline because we wouldn't let somebody talk about yeah. sport if they didn't know the difference between cricket and rugby. So yeah. why do we have this person talking about medical issues and science when they don't uh, understand the absolute basics? Um, and you might also say, well, look, you know, yeah. here's the clip. We're hosting it. Free to access. Here you are. Mm. Here it is, mm. fine, and job done. But instead, they just continued to to inflame and dig, do things which I think a lot of people, again, are interpreting as further efforts to stifle debate, and I think they've had very, very bad PR advice again. I mean, I almost feel sorry for Jenny Barnett. One of the things that happened in the last couple of days, Ben, was Jenny's agent um, came out and said that she's been receiving abusive emails and abusive um, personal attacks on her blog and that was the reasons why she took off the comments from people that were writing on her blog and saying hey we think you might be misinformed yeah this person who were who were sort of invited to feel 
Um, sorry for because she's been upset by by horrible comments. I mean, firstly, they said horrible exactly. comments, and there weren't, I don't think, any really very horrible comments on her blog. There were more horrible comments on her blog about me than there were about her. Um, I, think, <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think everybody has to be very careful in, in, in debates like this um, not to sort of childishly start competing for victimhood and the sort of role as the most bullied person. You know, there are some idiots on the internet no. who post stupid things, but that's not a news story, you know. Um, yeah. But also, yeah, you're right. I mean, there was a there was a um, an air of uh, irony and I suppose hypocrisy. You know, on the one hand, here was somebody who was saying, um, "I'm being really horribly treated here and bullied," but on the other hand, yeah, a very wealthy um, TV presenter and radio presenter on her very well be- bre- well read personal blog was posting mm. very, very inappropriate things about a nurse who'd rung into her programme, Yasmin, who was extremely polite and courteous. I mean, the ridiculous thing about them... She was. ...about them insisting on taking the clip down is, well, h- how am I going to... How am I going to prove to you that Yasmin was polite and courteous and nice, you know? Because LBC mm. don't won't mm. let you hear the clip. You know, here is a, 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 an extremely wealthy television presenter, radio presenter, with, with access, with a platform... And to my mind, she abused that by describing Yasmin, Mm -hmm. a nurse who works for the NHS for the public good, who rang up very politely and courteously, by describing her as vicious. And then, most crucially of all, deleting all the comments from her blog, including, Mm. you know, defence, you know, people who were defending um, Yasmin against that accusation. So, Ben, what what do you think of this sort of, this Streisand effect that, that got, got all these people together from all over the world. It was like a new sort of sceptical force in a way, wasn't it, that almost happened overnight? It was amazing. I mean, I wouldn't want to be sort of narcissistic about it. I mean, I don't, you know, it was... Well, go it on. Was, go no, on. Uh, no, but it was, yeah, it was, it's, it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of flattering, but, but I think it's, I think what's really, what's really, really good about it is so much of the coverage, so much of what people wrote was incredibly thoughtful and balanced and sensible and where it was sort of silly and childish and funny it was silly and childish and funny in exactly the kind of way that I enjoy <laughs> you know and and mm. and and so constructive that it, I mean that was what was really amazing about it was actually was to kind of go god not only are there quite a lot of us but actually we're all quite quite sound minded and that was the um Mm-hmm. That was the really great thing. I think, you know, that and the fact that also now, with so many people covering it, with so much attention drawn to it, it has become what I, what I, what I initially hoped, which is this very instructive um, example. And people are really sort of going through it piece by piece and sort of pulling out all of the errors and misrepresentations and, and everybody's kind of linking to everybody else and, and talking through stuff. Um, and actually, I think, I think the, one, the only sort of one thing that maybe needs to happen now um, that would be really useful. Uh, I don't know if it has happened yet. Is um, if anybody was sort of was bored and uh, procrastinating on a more important project, uh, <laughs> maybe to to, to really right. to really collate um, to collate the forty the whole forty four minute transcript um, with links to the rebuttals of each and every step would just be a fascinating and hilarious document to have because you know we've crowdsourced so much um energy and and knowledge here um and it's you know i think it's a i think it's a great example of what things can do but and it's also a great example of the sort yeah. of the paradoxical eff- effects that things can have on the internet um i mean if you asked for it yeah. to happen it would never happen you know it just it just wouldn't For those of you yet to hear the broadcast, the entire 44-minute excerpt from Jenny's show is posted on my YouTube account located at Rachie Sid, R-A-C-H-I-E-S-Y-D. For the full transcript, visit the Science Punk blog at scienceblogs.com. I am also hosting part four of the transcript at my blog, The Skeptic's Book of Poo Poo, located at www.skepticsbook.com. Zone reporter Kylie Sturgis also has part of the transcript at podblack.com. You can find links to other blogs about the affair at Holford Watch. Visit holfordwatch.info. Plus, check Ben's blog at badscience.net for updates and news. After the break, more Ben Goldacre, part two of my interview from two weeks ago 
where we continue our discussion about the Matthias Rath defamation case and bad science reporting by the mainstream media. You're listening to Far by George Harab. You can find out more about George Harab by visiting his website at www.georgeharab.blogspot.com where you can even find the lyrics to this song. Try singing along with it. Of course, he's singing about the 365 Days of Astronomy podcast. One podcast every day for 2009. And you can find that at 365 Days of Astronomy, one word, dot org check it out. There'll be a contribution by the Skeptic Zone in May. This stuff is far. It's really far. This stuff is far, far, far away. We're talking far. Like far, far. Taking there by car in a day. It's super duper crazy far, but just pulsars, quasars, and stars. I mean, it's far, far, far. 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 If there's some doubt, listen to a shout. This stuff is far. Hello. I'm Dr. Karen Stolzner from the Skeptic blog and Bad Language. I'm also editor of The Skeptic magazine. The Skeptic is an almost 30-year-old magazine about skepticism, science and society. We feature skeptical articles about a broad range of paranormal, occult and supernatural topics, including ghosts, astrology, psychics, UFOs and cults. We talk the skeptical talk, but also walk the skeptical walk. The Skeptic Road tests pseudoscience, investigates bizarre beliefs and practices like firewalking and divining. You'll recognise a few faces from the Skeptic Zone too, including Richard Saunders, Dr Rachel Dunlop, Michael Woolahan, Kylie Sturgis and me. We're always looking for new contributors and new readers. Visit the link on our website at www.skeptics.com.au where you can check out some articles and subscribe. And look out for The Skeptic in newsstands and bookstores soon. In our last Skeptic Zone special, we spoke with Dr. Ben Goldacre of the Bad Science column, blog and book. He told us all about his experiences exposing the misrepresentation of science in the media. He also gave us some insight into the details surrounding the libel or defamation case brought against him and The Guardian by Matthias Rath. And this was a result of Ben's criticism of the man's campaign to introduce vitamins as a cure for AIDS in South Africa. On this week's Skeptic Zone special, we present part two of this interview, where Ben covers the outcome of the case and tells us why he is just as critical of the pharmaceutical industry as he is of the alternative medicine community. I started off by asking Ben about the outcome of the libel case. Uh, Well, he pulled out um, after 15 months of, you know, having to tool around and deal with lawyers and stuff. Um, Our legal costs were £535,000, of which he's already paid, I think, 220000 and we're pursuing him uh, for the remainder. It's worth pointing out that he's, um, you know, he's got a long track record of suing people, people including Médecins Sans Frontières. I mean, who sues? What? He tried to sue Médecins Sans Frontières? Yeah, and there's no, he did, yeah, and there was this really weary what? press release when it collapsed where they just sort of said, we're really glad this is over now, we can get <laughs> on with doing, like, real work. Um, you know, he sued... Uh, I mean, it's endless, the list of people that he sued. Um, uh, he Good sued grief. Treatment Action Campaign, all of that. Yeah, I mean, when you're suing MSF, you know you're like... You know, There's something anyway. wrong with you, really, isn't it? Well, yeah, I yeah. guess so. That's that's the way it is with the, with our legal system. And I, uh, mm. But, I, I mean, I suppose, you know, I'm... Uh, one tenacious f- you know um and <laughs> i guess i mean you come out of 15 months of that uh, sort of scale of nonsense with um with a very large number of boxes containing witness statements and uh examples of adverts from Matthias Rath and all of that and i guess i now know more about this guy than uh probably anybody else in the world with the exception of the people in South Africa you know like TAC I'm not a wealthy man I need to sort of make the best that I can of the time that I've spent on that so I guess um you know I'm gonna have to write a 
maybe a book about Matthias Rath or find some useful uh, sort of way of, of, of putting all that time to use, you know, I mean, not, not, not out of vindictiveness, but just, you know, I mean, I, there's a lot of information there, which I suppose, um, you know, it, uh, it would be a tragedy if some good didn't come of this yes, uh, ridiculous, sure. really sort of, you know, million dollar waste of, of time and effort. And effort and money, yeah. Well, one of the things that you do, Ben, is you're very critical of alt- alternative medicine, but you're also critical of big pharma. And mm. this confuses a lot of your critics because they try to go with the line of big pharma stooge, but in fact you're just as critical of big pharma. Can you give us some idea about why you criticise big pharma? Uh, because they do really bad stuff. I mean, there's no... <laughs> Can you be more specific? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, um, I mean, this is kind of, you know, this is what I, I teach medical students and, and doctors on this. You know, I do a uh, lecture and course um, it's called Drug Company Bullshit is how it actually w- is, appears on the UCL timetable. I was delighted right. to see that <laughs> elsewhere it's called Critically Appraising Clinical Trial Methodologies from Industry. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, I don't see any real dividing line between big pharma and um, alternative therapists, quacks. You know, they're all using the same tricks, the same sleights of hand to sell pills and treatments to people. And they're all using the same tricks to misrepresent evidence. I mean, uh, Big Pharma, because they're not allowed to advertise directly to doctors outside of America and New Zealand, um, Big Pharma tends to have to use slightly more sophisticated tricks uh, because they're using these tricks on people like pharmacists and doctors. Um, So the sleights of hands have to be slightly more elegant and sophisticated and also because they're not sort of carrying out these acts of slight of hand in terms of misrepresenting the evidence so commonly in mainstream popular culture it's a discourse that happens uh, in academia and in sort of teaching i mean i i couldn't very well write about a fair few of the things that i teach on to doctors and medical students because uh they're not examples from popular culture you know sort of stand out a bit although I do often in the column uh, wherever I can wherever there's something that sort of hit the news then I'll certainly um, dive in um, but the tricks of the trade are all exactly the same and all of the all of the things that you know homeopaths use to rig their trials like inadequate blinding inadequate randomization that kind of thing have all been seen in in pharmaceutical industry trials before I'm working on something at the moment with a couple of uh, f- colleagues on um interpretive bias in acupuncture studies and it's really interesting how you know exactly the same things are found in acupuncture studies that you find in big pharma so um interpretive bias is basically you know you've reported the methods and the results of your experiment accurately but your interpretation of those in the discussion section is just completely bonkers and off the wall yeah, and in the acupuncture world the rest of it, yeah exactly yeah so in the acupuncture world it's um you know people do three armed studies they do uh, sort of you know treatment as usually in a or, or, or sort of no treatment at all, then sham acupuncture, sort of randomly using fake needles at random points of the body against genuine acupuncture, so proper full-on ceremonial acupuncture. And the results of these trials are almost always both sham and genuine acupuncture do better than nothing, but mm. there's no difference between sham acupuncture and genuine acupuncture. And uh, all of the acupuncturists say, oh, right, that means acupuncture works. And you're like, no, it doesn't. It means that it's a really elaborate placebo ritual with lots of sort of ceremonial components works. And that doesn't surprise me. I'm cool with that, you know, get in there. Um, But uh, what's interesting about that is that exactly the same thing happens in mainstream medicine. So, for example, there was a very interesting study recently comparing uh, industry-funded meta-analysis meta-analyses mm. against independent mm-hmm. uh, Cochrane meta-analyses and they found that the actual results that they reported were genu- generally the same but the industry-funded meta-analyses tended in their discussion sections to say and that means our drug works <laughs> whereas the independent ones would tend to say and that means it's not really worth using <laughs> and so you know it's it's you know it's just how surprising yeah yeah who'd have thought eh? so it's just fascinating really how the different um, sort of industries use exactly the same um tricks and you know the other thing is you know all of the things that um that alternative therapists accuse other people of you know they do and that's uh, yeah. 
that's what I find fascinating. But then, you know, I mean, I think it's important to remember that in the world of alternative therapy, you know, they set themselves up in opposition to the pharmaceutical industry, not in any meaningful sense, but just as an aspect of their brand identity. And they do so with good reason, because there have been huge numbers of surveys of why people do, uh, why people go for alternative therapies. And it's actually very, very hard to find anything consistent and expected. So, for example, you know, a level of scientific understanding doesn't correlate very well with how much people use alternative therapies. Um, But the one thing that does repeatedly come out is that people who've had a bad experience with mainstream medicine are more likely to seek out alternative therapies. And I think the people who are marketing these alternative therapies know that. And that's why they set themselves up in opposition to big pharma. That's why and and mainstream medicine, you know, that's why they're constantly sort of making these uh, rather shrill and melodramatic critiques of mainstream medicine, which I think, again, you know, represent um, quite a serious opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is, you know, the true cost of of something is what you give up in order to get it. So an Mm. opportunity cost is something that you, you do wastefully when you could be doing something useful instead. And that's, that's probably the greatest concrete harm that comes from alternative therapies because, firstly, when you could be spending all of this sort of health risk behaviour motivation that you have on doing something useful for your health, instead you're buying these pointless vitamin pills or, yes. or you know, doing a five-day detox or something. But the other problem is that, you know, there's a cultural opportunity cost, which is there are huge, huge problems with the way that the pharmaceutical industry runs itself. And they do practically run themselves because uh, regulators yeah. have repeatedly shown themselves to be pretty, pretty hopeless in this area there are huge problems with the way that big pharma is going but they're slightly complicated issues and they don't have any purchase in popular culture but instead what you get is this really childish trite stuff like you know big pharma is evil therefore homeopathy works better than placebo big pharma is evil therefore vaccines cause autism and the tragedy of that is that I wrote about the the pharmaceutical industry deliberately hiding evidence of harm from their drugs and evidence of drugs not being much better than placebo. I wrote about that in national newspapers. That was SSRIs, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I wrote about that in, in three different newspapers on two different continents. That story lasted globally for about five days. Mm-hmm. And then it just mm. died. And that was a true story about real bad stuff that will still go on because the regulatory response to it is inadequate. We don't have, you know, proper clinical trials registers and all the stuff I write about in the book. God, I'm so crap, aren't I? The book. Buy the book. The book, the book, the book. <laughs> um, uh, you know, they, we don't have any of that stuff uh, in place. Yeah. Meanwhile, this childish fantasy that, that the MMR vaccine causes autism in the UK has run for 10 years. You know, and the people who are driving it have the grandiosity to portray themselves as these noble figures battling against big pharma. And you just think, you know, you guys are just the biggest barrier to a meaningful discourse on, on the crimes of the pharmaceutical industry that I could possibly imagine, you know? Well, it was, Ben, it was only yesterday that another article appeared in the, in the BBC, I, I believe, wasn't it, in print about MMR. Daily Mail, actually. Uh, Daily yeah. Mail, yeah, it wasn't even autism. It was some other, so you know, it was just, you know, a kid who suddenly got ill and it was a couple of days after having the vaccine. Yeah, that's right. I mean, what, what you're kind of seeing there is, is a number of different things. Firstly, in mainstream medicine, we, we have this thing called the hierarchy of evidence, right, which is meta-analyses, which are you get all of the results from all of your little clinical trials and you put them all into one big spreadsheet and you get a really big uh, number of, of participants. And so that gives you a much more accurate uh, answer of whether a treatment works or not, right? Uh, so in the hierarchy of evidence in mainstream medicine, meta-analysis and systematic review are right at the top. And then it kind of goes down. You go trials, observational studies, prospective cohort studies, case control. Then right at the bottom, you have individual case reports, like, you know, anecdotes, and then right at the bottom, even below that, you have expert opinion, <laughs> because, you know, that's, expert opinion is definitely always bullshit. Um, and, <laughs> and the interesting thing about that is it seems to me that in mainstream media, and I'm doing a, a, a quantitative study on, on media output in the UK on this at the moment, it seems to me that the hierarchy of evidence in mainstream media is, is inverted. So uh, individual case reports and expert opinions are front page news page news right but 
meta-analyses and Cochrane reviews and stuff yes. barely yeah. register. You know, they barely deserve a mention. Uh, yeah. And that, to me, is really fascinating. You know, I've, I've got a paper being submitted at the moment showing that over the past year, a whole year's worth of coverage for the Cochrane Library, which is, you know, produces gold standard systematic reviews and meta-analyses it's this independent academic collaboration that's worldwide truly amazing resource and institution uh, it is. they publish about 600 systematic reviews and meta-analyses every year and in the uk they had 50 items of news coverage in one year in total throughout all newspapers mm-hmm. and that's nothing you know yeah and that's that's, that's what doctors and academics would consider to be gold standard evidence and it's yeah. nowhere in mainstream media Meanwhile, these sort of little stories are front page news. But anyway, the, I mean, the other interesting thing about the, that article in the Daily Mail is that individual children may well occasionally have adverse consequences from vaccination. I don't know about the details of this case. I do know that they had an exact, they had a very similar case about a month ago where they were saying, oh, uh, you know, this coroner's report is coming up. There's a coroner's case. It's being heard at the moment. It's MMR vaccine on trial. Uh, this child mm. was damaged by the MMR vaccine. And they reported all of that while it was ongoing. And then the result of the coroner's inquest was, yeah, this had nothing to do with the MMR vaccine. <laughs> and only one of the eight new newspapers or something that had covered it actually bothered to report the outcome which is sure, pretty yeah. astonishing but, but anyway but you, you know t- you talk about that even if book. sorry go yeah, on yeah. Then. no no you were mentioning my book that's great i'm very bad <laughs> the book well no the you book, talk about that in in your book bad science because you talk about how a lot of these big stories don't go to specialist science journalists they'll go to journalists who don't have much expertise in this area so They'll just follow the, the line of, well, the evidence has been debunked, but when it never was really there, in the case of MMR at least. That's one of the yeah. things you talk about. Um, so in the book, yeah, I mean, I kind of, I kind of try and go uh, after a prolonged sort of parade of morons from mainstream news media. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I sort of try to understand what's going on here. And you're right. One of the, one of the most interesting things is when I first got into this game, I, I thought all health and science journalists must just be morons because there was no mm-hmm. other explanation for the phenomena that I was observing. But actually, it turns out that it's it's a bit more complicated than that. You know, um, actually, that's the. Uh, <laughs> that's that's the uh, slogan on a t-shirt that I'm selling through the website Bad Science Done. I personally believe this is the funniest slogan t-shirt ever produced in the history of mankind. It just says, "I think you'll find it's a bit more complicated than that." And uh, it's on <laughs> purpose. And we're holding a competition where you can send in pictures of you wearing the t-shirt next to somebody else wearing their own slogan t-shirt. So it's like drop beats, not bombs. I think you'll find it's a bit more complicated than that and uh, stuff. I saw somebody on the tube the other day wearing a T-shirt that said, I need a hug. And I just thought, this is the perfect opportunity. <laughs> uh, can, but anyway. Can I, um, can I suggest something to you, Ben, just to, just quickly? I'd love you to yes. make a T-shirt of the um, the title of your blog recently, the one that said, the bare-faced cheek of these characters will never cease to amaze and delight me. <laughs> that, that's one of the best titles for a blog I've ever seen. That that's gave me kind. such a big laugh. They are pretty shameless. Yeah. But anyway, uh, what we do? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, so it's a bit more complicated than just science and health journalists being being morons. In actual fact, it, it seems to be more commonly that it's sort of senior figures at the paper. You know, the sort of the flaky humanities graduates in senior executive and editorial roles who who wear their ignorance of basic science as a matter of pride mm-hmm. on yeah. their sleeves, uh, who sort of go up to the health and science correspondents and say, "You must cover this stupid story." And then there are sort of big arguments, and that happened with things like, you know, the kind of journalism stuff, like all men will have big willies, the the sort of bogus yeah. PR, um, sort of, you know, the equations for the happiest day of the year, sponsored by a travel company, and it's the end of January, perfect time to book a holiday. If equation for the happiest day of the year is the is, uh, uh, beginning of summer, perfect time for buying ice cream and sponsored by actually, an ice cream ben, company I, and that sort of thing. Actually, actually um, Ben, it was reported here on the 19th of January that it was the um, most depressing day of the year. That was we we got one of those stories because I just read your book and I read all that and then it appeared in the papers here on the nineteenth of January. 
That's yeah. so brilliantly nuts. But anyway, um, so, you know, the, the science and health correspondents are sort of approached by senior editorial figures to write up stupid stories like that. And I now know, because I go out drinking with these people, that they say, look, please don't make me write the really stupid mm. story. And then, a, you know, a, a battle will ensue. But even more interestingly than that, when a story becomes a big political hot potato, it tends to get taken out of the hands of the individual specialist health and science journalists and put into the hands of the generalists, you know, the star news yes. uh, yeah. correspondent, the columnist who's normally writing about a really funny thing the au pair said on the way to a dinner party. Um, Suddenly, those jokers are writing about MMR and giving people... Uh, you know, health advice on really complicated issues of immunology and epidemiology. Um, and in the case of MMR, for example, um, there's a very good study done by Cardiff University School of Journalism, which showed that stories about MMR were twice as likely to be written about by generalists. I think it was 80 percent of all stories were written about by generalists. Right. Um, twice as likely to be written about by generalists than stories about cloning, for example. And, and right. other science stories. Um, so, you know, as obviously as soon as the morons took over, the quality of the coverage <laughs> declined. And you can see exactly the same thing with GM. So I personally have a slightly sort of conflicted relationship with GM food because I'm not very enthusiastic about GM food, not because I think it's going to kill us, not because I think, you know, it's not this sort of, you know, this sort of weird green narcissistic thing of I am personally going to come to harm from genetically modified food. I'm dubious about GM food because it strikes me as yet another opportunity for multinational corporations to try and take control of the global food stock and particularly the production of food in developing countries. You know, also Monsanto is the company that made um, Agent Orange, you know, and there are yes, certain things yeah. that are quite hard to forgive. Uh, so I- I've got a problem with GM food. Food, but it's not GM food is going to kill us all, right? But that was the headline stories in 1998 in UK. It was like Frankenstein food and all of that stuff. And fascinatingly, for the first three days of the GM Frankenstein food scare stories in the British news media, not a single one of the news or comment pieces in any single national newspaper in the UK was written by a specialist health or science correspondent. Not a single one. (laughs) And when you talk to the old duffers who were around back then, because obviously 10 years ago makes you an old duffer. Um, <laughs> if he talks to the people who are old dufferish enough to have retired and not care anymore and be willing to be very indiscreet with you at parties, they will say, you know, we were hammering on the editor's door saying, what are you doing with this story? This is 90% cock. But they mm. weren't listened to. And that, I think, is the kind of real backstory to how so much dismal coverage gets into the news. Yeah. Well, a lot of this stuff is covered in your book, Ben. So how can our listeners get a copy of your best-selling book, Bad Science? Well, that's a very, very good question. I don't know. Can you buy it? In Australia? I mean, it's about, it's out in Australia, but I, I sort of had this vague sensation that it was maybe annoyingly difficult to find. I mean, it shouldn't be. It sold one metric ton of copies over here, I have to say, to my astonishment and slight concern. Well, it, it, but it sold should, out over um, Christmas in the UK, didn't it? It sold out over Christmas in the UK? They had like three emergency repressings. I don't know how many wow. emergency repressings you have to have before it's sort of just routine. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I think there are something like 60 or 70,000 copies in print, 45 or 50,000 have sold already. It's, it's bizarre. It really does mm. surprise me. <laughs> but anyway. Um, oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's so, a brilliant book. Uh, I've, I've read it a, a couple of times. I really enjoyed it. That's very kind. But I don't, I mean, I hope that the, ex- the examples aren't, aren't too English for an Australian audience. I mean, you have Gillian McKeith over there, don't you? Um, well, but we, mostly we, the examples. No, we don't, but don't I forget, think. Ben, we're an international show, so we go to America and the UK and everywhere. So oh. a lot of. Well, people... yeah, so America's really bugging me at the moment, actually, because, I mean, half my web traffic comes from the US, and loads of people have asked me if it's going to come out there and stuff, and um, the only publishers who want it are the hot sort of american version of harper collins and they want to sort of take lots of things out i've just been talking to right. them about it yesterday actually they want to sort of take things out that aren't very american and i'm gonna i mean i'd really appreciate actually if anybody wants to sort of email me ben at badscience.net if you've got any sort of advice on i'm really sorry to use your podcast to solicit help no uh, please, if anyone's got any, go ahead if, anyone, if anyone's <laughs> got any good sort of advice on what sort of um on what sort of stories from the book are likely to to be mystifying to an American audience, that'd be really useful. Or, or if people have got any good sort of parallel replacement examples, um, I don't think I can replace my 15 
thousand word takedown of the MMR vaccine hoax with the American Mercury story. But I think actually it's I'm, hopefully they'll be persuadable that it's um, useful to have a sort of an English parallel of a vaccine mm. hoax um, that has now sort of played itself out to extinction almost in the UK as they are kind of at the beginning and the middle of their Mercury hoax. Yeah, I think it translates to the States, not necessarily the MMR, the thimerosal thing, but the the Jim Carrey and Jenny McCarthy thing that's still so big. Yeah, the whole sort of celebrity um, expert thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. The thing that worries me is there, there might be a version, an American version with sort of bits missing that people might buy by mistake. But anyway, this is a, not of any interest at all to a global audience. And I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but yes, if anybody's got any advice on how to sort of foreignise my book, I'd love to hear from them. But you, you also want people to send you stories from other parts of the world that would possibly be relevant for you? Oh, God, always. But what I really want people to do is to start a blog. I mean, sometimes people send me emails that are just so sort of amazingly ornate and, and well-researched. There's so much really sort of valuable nerd energy out there. I think if we harnessed all of the angry nerds in the world, we could have this sort of <laughs> automatic refutation box that would just, you know, produce an equal and opposite output to all of the cock that's around. I mean, I think, you know, ignore the internet to a large extent because I just, I don't know, these sort of squabbles of, you know, some loony over there said something silly on the internet. Maybe I'm being... I don't know. Too. Sort of, well, no. I don't know. Ben, you, I, I think you play. You, can't police the... you, you play your part with badscience.net, I think, in that sense. It's very kind. There's some. I mean, there are some truly amazing blogs around. Badscience. Badscienceblogs.net, incidentally, um, is like an aggregator of lots and lots of other English blogs that look at misrepresentation of science in the media and quacks and big pharma and stuff. Uh, so, if people that are interested in that sort of stuff, that's really good. And people like uh, Quackometer and David Colhoun are really good in there. Uh, as Excellent. well as lots of others. Excellent. So, Ben, are you going to be at TAM in 2009? Uh, is that the English one? Yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, the English TAM? Or I was referring to the American TAM. Oh, I don't know. I haven't been invited. Maybe I did something oh, bad at the last one. Whoops. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I've never sort of, I sort of massively identified myself with the sceptics movement. I don't, um, it's sort of, it's not, uh, it's not really a sort of group in England and also I'm sort of pathologically not a joiner I suppose but also I don't really care about ghosts and psychics and stuff I quite okay. I quite enjoy yep. all that stuff uh, do you get angry about ghosts that's fine I don't mind you can um, no I I don't tend to get angry about ghosts I tend to get angry about alternative medicine personally but that's just my thing but anyway oh, but you've got to love them they bring us so <laughs> much joy and so many valuable teaching opportunities <laughs> <laughs> at the moment, Ben, I'm actually researching ear candles and I'm just astounded as to how completely stupid they are. But that's another story. But, you know, I kind of think, again, they are so stupid that, <laughs> that it's interesting to talk about how stupid they are and it's interesting just for the amusement value to quote that paper that actually measured the vacuum and all that stuff. Yes. But are these really accidents or are they throwing themselves willingly into the roads? You know, I, I just... I just don't know. And uh, people who are so stupid that they'll buy ear candles, I think that ear candles will be the least of their worries. You know? Right, OK. That's a good way of looking at it. Anyway, Ben, I think we'd better wrap this up. Cool. But thank you so much for, thank you so much for joining us on The Zone today. That was very good fun. As a little present, we're going to send you a DVD of Australian poetry, which is done by our voiceover man, Jim Wiltshire. Excellent. Which I hope you'll enjoy. And also a DVD on How to Fold Origami by Richard Saunders. Cool, that will be handy. Hours of fun. And also a copy of The Great Skeptic CD from Australian Skeptics. Cool, anything with Australian accents. You know I'm Australian. I mean, on paper only. Obviously, in the flesh, I'm possibly the most English man you've ever met. <laughs> but I have, like, an Australian passport and everything. I am Aussie Velo... Yeah, yeah, no, I went to school in Perth and stuff, and all my family live in Australia. Oh, right, OK. I just put this accent on because I'm desperate for approval. Right. Well, perhaps you might like to come down in 2010 for the Australian National Skeptics Conference, Ben. Oh, yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> oh, well, come on down, mate. We'll see you in 2010. <laughs> Excellent. That's extremely kind. Uh, cool. OK, well, cheers. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining me for this week's Skeptic Zone special. We are very grateful to Ben Goldacre for giving us his time two weeks in a row. 
Join us next week for our regular show, where I will be back with Dr. Rachie Reports, plus our other regular segments, The Roundup, Grain of Salt, The Think Tank, plus Richard and Stefan Return. Until next time, this has been Dr. Rachie saying goodbye from the Skeptic Zone. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts and extra video reports. The Skeptic Zone